Okay, well, rather than uh, sit in silence and stare at each other on the screen, um, I'd like to, uh, to kick off tonight's event. We're 135 of us online uh, so far, uh, with more coming in as we speak. Um, on behalf of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the third in a series of four public lectures in this year's forum lecture series. My name is Ben Johnny. I'm an associate professor at the school and I coordinate the undergraduate urbanism program. And although we're online tonight, I should begin by noting that Carleton University acknowledges the location of its campus on traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin nation. And in doing so, the university acknowledges that it has a responsibility to the Algonquin people and a responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocols. In line with the theme of tonight's lecture, I should also note that Carleton is launching its new equity, diversity and inclusion action plan a month from today on Tuesday, March 23rd. First order of business tonight is to introduce my co-host uh, for the evening, which is Nicole Moyo, uh, a native of Zimbabwe. Nicole was the first graduate of Carleton's BAS urbanism program. She returned to Carleton to do her master's degree in architecture during which she completed her thesis, Ugubutha, which presents an innovative solution mobilizing communities in informal settlements in South Africa and elsewhere and providing them with a means to create independent community-based water, energy, and waste systems. This project has won numerous international awards. For the past several years, Nicole has been interning at Dialogue Architects in Toronto. This fall, she re-engaged with Carleton to coordinate a very incisive uh, reboot of our professional practice course. And Nicole is joining us tonight from South Africa, where she's been remo working remotely for the past few months. And moving forward, I'd like to thank the founding sponsors of the Forum Lecture Series, namely GRC Architects, uh, Trinity Developments, Merkley Supply, Charles Fort Developments, Hoban Architecture, and IBI Architects. I should also mention that this is uh, that the final lecture in this year's series uh, is scheduled for next Tuesday, March 2nd, and you can see the schedule there on your screen. Uh, we'll be pleased to welcome Ma Mabel Wilson. Tonight, we're being joined by members of the Ottawa Regional Society of Architects, whom we've invited to say a few words. So please allow me to introduce Christopher Moyes and Mitch Vanderborn. Uh, Christopher Moyes is an architect and urban designer working for the City of Ottawa, a director of the Built Environment Open Forum, which publishes the Right Angle Journal. Uh, and he's currently chair of the Ottawa Regional Society of Architects. And Mitch Vanderborn is a volunteer organizer uh, with Carlton, or sorry, with uh, Ottawa Architecture Week. He's a graduate of Carleton from the journalism program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christopher. Christopher. Thanks, Ben. And uh, hello and good evening to everybody. Um, we're delighted to be a sponsor of tonight's event. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to share some exciting news we have. Uh, we've been busy developing a new website for ORSA, which we plan to launch in April. The site will be more community-based and deliver up-to-date information, resources, new events, and most importantly, volunteer opportunities. The main focus of the executive has been towards building an active communication strategy, which is centered around the new website platform and social media platforms, and includes exciting events like tonight's lecture and an interesting roster for Auto Architecture Week, which my friend Mitch will share details with you. Take it away, Mitch. Thanks, Christopher. Um, so for those of you who uh, aren't already familiar with us, Ottawa Architecture Week is an annual festival that explores and celebrates architecture, art, uh, and urbanism and design in Ottawa, with a focus on engaging uh, the public and facilitating a dialogue around how people interact with the built environment in our city. Uh, each year we design OAW around an important theme. Uh, in past years we focused on things like flooding, uh, gentrification, density, affordable housing. Uh, so like most things in 2020, our plans to hold a regular festival in the fall uh, got flipped upside down. Um, so we're moving things forward into 2021 and holding a couple events this March with the hope of being able to hold something a bit closer to normal uh, this fall. Um, so as you can see on the screen, this year's theme is Never Normal, Lessons from Adversity. And here, throughout this year, we really want to, you know, uh, foster a little bit of introspection and look at the agility and adaptiveness that Ottawa showed in responding to the pandemic. But in these changes, we want to talk about, you know, what's changed in, in terms of how we interact with the city. Um, are these changes welcome? And what have we learned? And has it made us stronger or not? 
Uh, so on March 10th, uh, we'd like to invite you to a digital movie night. Um, we'll be starting with a screening of a 21, 2021 documentary called A Machine to Live In, uh, which looks at the history of highly controlled modernist planning in Brazil, uh, which will follow up with a panel discussion and hopefully a word from the director. Um, and then we'll also be holding an online Pecha Kucha night as we do most years, um, where you'll see speakers give a short six minute talks connected to the theme. Uh, so finally, OAW is run by volunteers, uh, and we'd love to see new folks come out to join us uh, on the organizing committee. Um, we welcome partnerships as well with organizations like our good friends at Carleton Architecture. Um, and last year, we were able to work with people at you know, the Ottawa School of Art, the Ottawa Tool Library to host a series of youth design workshops, uh, which we're hoping to hold more of a little bit later this year. So if you'd like to learn more, you can check us out at oawfest.com or uh, get in touch with us on social media via at oawfest. Um, so I hope you'll join us in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mitch. Um, I should note that tonight's lecture will be followed by a discussion period, uh, which Nicole and myself will kick off. But we very much encourage all of you to post questions using the Q&A function. Uh, you should see the box at the bottom of your screen. Now. Getting to the main event. I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Leslie Kern. She holds a PhD in women's studies from York, York University and is currently an associate professor of geography and environment and director of women and gender studies at Mount Allison University. She's the author of two books on genders and cities, including Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World, which discusses not only how our cities have failed to, uh, in terms of fear, motherhood, friendship, activism, and the joys and perils of being alone, but also imagines what these cities could become. In a recent article published in The Guardian, Professor Kern comments on the physical and metaphorical reminders of masculine power in the city, observing that, quote, we rarely talk of the urban landscape as an active participant in gender inequality, unquote. Kern argues that the pandemic has shown us that society can be radically reorganized if necessary. And she challenges us to look for opportunities for change in employing in listening to diverse groups of people in urban design, in planning, policy making, politics, and in architecture. So please join me in a very warm welcome to Leslie Kern. Leslie? Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's a real honor and a real delight to be able to join you today. I'm coming to you from the place that's currently known as Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, which is on unceded Mi'kmaq and Maliseet territory where we are guided and governed by ongoing treaties of peace and friendship here. My pronouns are she, her, and if you're interested in following me on social media, you can find me at Lely K. I really wanna thank you for inviting a non-architect, non-planner to your um, special e events, um, as part of this week and as part of the, the lecture series, I'm definitely not here to tell anyone in architecture or planning how to do their job, but I, I do think that the book and, and the things that I've written about can function not as a blueprint, but as uh, a set of guiding principles, maybe a way of thinking about things a little bit differently that could orient us towards some I hope productive changes, especially in this moment where everything is really shaken up in, in all sorts of different ways. And we want to be thinking about how are we going to rebuild? We have heard a lot of people say we can't go back to normal. And I absolutely agree with that. So what is our new normal going to look like? And what does that have to do with cities? What does that have to do with planning and architecture? And what does it have to do with gender and other forms of equality? So my objective in speaking to you tonight and my larger overall project is to explore how feminist principles might help transform our cities into more just, equitable, and sustainable spaces. In order to start this off, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit and think about the idea of the man-made city. That's the subtitle, I guess, of the US and UK version of my book is Claiming Space in the Man-Made City. But what does it mean to say it's a, a man-made city. Well, there's a few things that we could think about here. One is that uh, still in 2021, planning, urban design, architecture, and urban policymaking are still very male-dominated professions. This doesn't necessarily mean that people in those professions are 
conspiring to make things worse for women or other equity seeking groups in the city. But I would say that sometimes it's hard to build, plan and design for experiences that you don't know about or that you haven't had in your own life. And the fact that women and other minority groups are still underrepresented in these fields suggests that there's perhaps a lack of diversity of different viewpoints that would enhance the way of thinking about the built environment. So I've shown an image here, which is the cover of a book that came out in 1987, published by the Matrix Collective in the UK called Making Space Women and the Man-Made Environment. And the image is of a woman hauling a pram with a baby in it up a steep set of stairs. And I think this kind of image and this kind of experience will be familiar to many women and other caregivers in the audience tonight. And maybe one of those very visceral embodied reminders of the man-made city. And I show this as well to remind us that these ideas have been around for a long time. These critiques of the man-made city are absolutely nothing new. I really love the um, blurb on the bottom of this book, which says a stiff challenge to the great macho myths of metropolitan architecture. So the work that I'm doing here very much builds on long traditions of these sorts of critiques. One of the other things that we could note is the way in which the male body, uh, kind of a mock-up of an average male body is taken as the universal standard in many design principles. And this uh, it comes into play in the built environment as well. I found a little anecdote that I relate in my book about the city of Toronto's wind tunnel standards for you know, how much wind force a human body should be forced to take on as they navigate a you know, wind tunnel with new skyscrapers and it's based around um, some kind of standard male body. When we get on a bus or a subway car and we go to reach up to try to hold on to the handle that's located well above us, it's obviously not very accessible for people who are shorter, which may include on average more women than men and things as simple as how heavy a door is, how much force you need to open it. <clears throat> Many of these things have been designed again with a male body and male standards as the, the norm. But we can go deeper than this as well beyond these kind of surface elements and recognize that the city historically has been set up to prioritize a typical male pattern of movement. I put typical here in air quotes because in 2021, I'm not sure how typical this even is for most men. So it's a kind of typical male pattern that's maybe based on the 50s, 60s, and 70s, rather than uh, the more complex and often more precarious work and home life arrangements that many families find themselves in today. But certainly decades of research have shown that women's journeys through the city tend to look different than men's. They make more stops, they're less linear, they engage both paid work and unpaid work. They make use of more public transit and pedestrian journeys than men do. And yet the priorities that we see in many of our cities around car traffic, for example, and transit systems that are designed to move you efficiently in and out of the city at a certain time of day from home to work and back again, are not really set up with these more complicated gendered patterns in mind. And even more deeply than that, we can start to recognize that there are a lot of gendered assumptions about home, about work, both paid and unpaid work, about what is a public space, what's a private space, and more. And these really saturate our buildings and cities. And once you start to scratch the surface, it's hard not to see them. So it's really this latter idea that I'm concerned with in my talk today. But I wanted to say a little bit more about this idea of the man-made city and a concept that we might call concrete patriarchy. The images that I'm showing right now of a pedestrian underpass, kind of a dank and damp looking place, uh, porta potties, a steep set of stairs going down into a subway station, and a beautiful classic New York brownstone with about 10 or 12 steps leading up to it are images, again, that for many of the women in the audience or non-binary people, you might look at these and immediately know on a gut level, oh yeah, these spaces were not designed with me in mind or nobody asked somebody like me about what I would want or need uh, in these environments. 
So I would hazard to say that many people, especially women, know on a gut level that the city is man-made. It's not designed for them. And this knowledge arises out of very everyday, banal, mundane experiences where the experience of being embodied as a woman reminds you that you have not really been taken into account. So in looking at transit systems, for example, this obviously presumes an able body. It's not really thinking about moving through this space with little children or baby or a stroller. It's not really considering aging and the limitations that might come with that is designed around an able-bodied commuter user and very few other people. The pedestrian tunnel and underpass going under a road reminds us to the, the extent to which car traffic has been prioritized over pedestrian needs. It's more efficient seemingly to allow cars unimpeded traffic and to force pedestrians usually down a flight of stairs and up another one and then through a dark and damp underpass. And these are the exact kind of places that <clears throat> when women report feeling fear of crime in cities, these are the exact locations that they would pinpoint. So we can see here how the prioritization of the car, which you might not think about as a feminist issue, is actually connected to concerns about gendered safety. The public toilet issue, I'm gonna come back to this even more later on in this talk. I can't stop talking about toilets, it seems during this pandemic and during this little book tour. But whether we're talking about true public outdoor toilets or toilets in various buildings and institutions, women's experience is quite different than men's. And I'm sure anyone in the audience can tell you all of the ways in which using a woman's public restroom is uh, often quite a nightmare. And that's not even considering the fact that the gender binary into which most restrooms are divided is not um, suitable for people who don't fit in to that gender binary and creates a lot of unsafety for many other groups as well. And of course, even housing itself uh, is designed around um, an imagined user that doesn't seem to take into account the fact that, you know, families live in this space. So I thought I would show an image of a tweet from Christine Murray, who's a feminist um, planner and critic working in the UK. And she's responding to a tweet that has images of two beautiful front doors. And the tweet says, create doors you want to enter. But these doors both have steps leading up to them. So Christine, tweets this. She says, turn buggy around backwards, roll buggy up steps using back wheel, hold buggy with one hand while fumbling with three locks to prevent buggy falling downstairs, push door with butt while holding Yale lock key in turn position, up last step into house, hope other kids follow buggy. This is again, it's just such a mundane, banal experience, yet points to the way in which these very everyday aspects of our urban environment are not really set up for uh, what I would call almost a majority of, of users. So what does all of this have to do with the COVID crisis? Well, in many ways, COVID has made some of these spatial and social inequalities more visible to a wider group of people. And so it's been a real honor over the past year with this book coming out to be able to have these conversations because I think there's a real openness and willingness and curiosity on the part of many people who perhaps didn't notice some of these issues before but are now confronted with them in their day-to-day -day life. So I've included here a couple of headlines that I think will be relatively familiar to people if you've been paying at all attention to things like gendered inequalities in the pandemic and they read COVID-19 is forcing women from the workplace in record numbers and we don't know when they'll be back. And the other says, how the pandemic has exacerbated the gender divide in household labor. So during this time, we're being forced to confront some of the things that we've taken for granted, um, especially around issues like the home. How does the form and function and location of the home and its designation of a private space can continue to exacerbate even further, this gender divide in household labor or to uphold this gender divide in household labor. Who, uh, whose workplaces are we prioritizing when we think about work and whose uh, safety do we care about in these sorts of spaces? 
who do we think about when we consider questions of mobility through the city? So who is forced onto crowded trains and buses for long journeys to go to their essential jobs, thus exposing themselves and families and co-workers to potential outbreaks of disease? And who has the privilege to work from home? But what kind of work is that? And what are the conditions in that home as well? These things are very um, entangled together. And of course, we have important questions about public space. So in a time when we are being encouraged to go outside more, to make use of public spaces as safer alternatives for social gatherings and other sorts of uh, human needs, in what ways have our urban spaces been shown to um, make this actually quite difficult for, for people. It's not just that they're not that hospitable, but over many decades of increased securitization, privatization, and militarization even of urban space, we found ourselves in a situation where many of our cities are actively hostile to everyday human uses, such as sitting and eating and socializing with people. And so this is perhaps a moment when we can think about how could we reclaim urban public space, but in ways that are equitable and as inclusive as possible? Of course, COVID-19 did not create these problems, but as I say, it's raised their visibility and in a moment where things are shaken up and disturbed, it offers an opportunity to ask certain kinds of questions and to seek out different sorts of answers. So what are some of these questions? Well, one of them would be, our are our homes, cities, and buildings really built to carry us through crisis, or are they lingering remnants of a previous era that are not serving us particularly well? We have to ask who and what are we relying on, and what I'm getting at here is questions of whose labor, both unpaid and underpaid labor, undervalued labor, and perhaps even stigmatized labor, are we relying on to keep our cities functioning? What assumptions underpin these systems? So assumptions about who does care work, for example, where care work takes place, whether it's acts of natural love or whether it is a, a valued part of the economy and how we might remunerate it, for example. So with those assumptions, we can ask what values arising out of those are informing design, whether that's implicitly or implicitly. And on a hopeful note, how does design perhaps contribute to the solution? We've seen some ways in which it can contribute to the problem, but how might it lead us to something better? So envisioning a post-feminist, uh, a post-feminist, envisioning a feminist post-COVID city. What does this mean? So all visions and ideals, utopian and other way, <clears throat> otherwise, have a set of values, norms, and uh, cultural biases that are built right into them, some of which we're aware of and some of which are, we're not aware of. But the good thing about that is that these are not written in stone. We can change them, we can shake them up, we can reimagine and we can foreground different sets of values and principles. So I'm just gonna suggest a few here today and try to provide a few examples of what these can look like in, in terms of real world examples from different places around the world. So the first thing I would suggest is kind of radical reimagining of the concept of the user. So I mentioned early on that the man-made city seems to have at its center an idea of a typical user, a typical male user that may in fact be a rather outdated concept and might not apply to the lives of nearly as many men as we think it ought to. But this urban citizen, this man who's a breadwinner, he's able-bodied, he's a family man in probably a heterosexual family, he's cisgendered and he's white is still perhaps implicitly at the center and assumed to be the majority, which I think when we take a hard look at it, we can recognize that the, minor the minority, who we think of as the minority, as the special interest group, as the niche group, as the niche user of a place, if we take all of those people together, 
we're actually the majority. So people who have different mobility needs, whether that's using a wheelchair or a walker or a cane, people who are parents and caregivers of young children who are using strollers or simply navigating with small people attached to them, people who are <clears throat> elderly, people who are not neurotypical, people who are women, people who are queer, people who are trans, that taken together, we're the majority, not this niche user. So I would suggest that any design that has at its center a kind of standard white male user is the niche design. That's designing for the special interest group. The good news about this is that when we design with a broader, more inclusive imagination, that normative white guy, if he's out there, he'll be just fine. We're not taking anything away from him. His needs will still be very well met. So this isn't about replacing one user and discarding his needs and interests and, and replacing it with somebody else. This is about broadening our concept of who the user is and recognizing that we, when we make improvements for one or more of these groups, we're really lifting things up and improving them for a much wider range of people. So I just wanna show a little example that somebody uh, shared with me a few months ago that just kind of made my head explode a little bit about what goes wrong when architects aren't really thinking about the user. So this is the relatively recently built library at Cornell University. And if you're able to see the image, you'll note that all of the flooring is metal grates. And the architect had the idea that this design would really showcase the books. The library was all about the books. Unfortunately, it didn't seem to take into account that humans and different sorts of humans would also need to use this space. So there was some quick criticism of this fine arts library that uh, as this headline I'm showing says, privileges architecture over people. As the writer here notes, these graded floors fail to account for such basic things as slushy snow boots, always a concern in New York State, anyone who would be wearing a skirt, people who use assisted mobility devices, and more. So sometimes we might forget about the human altogether. And within that, we're also likely to forget about these groups that have been designated as kind of special interest or niche users like women, like people with mobility devices, like small children, and so on. So how do we go about getting it right? Well, part of this process then has to be actually paying attention to the user, not even just imagining them in your head, but actually speaking to them, seeking them out, understanding what their needs are. And the good news is that there are groups and consultants and planners and architects and theorists who are, are and have been working on this for decades. So these tools are available. You don't have to invent them yourself just because you might have never encountered them before, but you can seek them out and you can find that all over the world there are individuals and collective organizations that have been thinking and working on these for a long time that can do this community consultation work from, for example, feminist and anti-racist perspectives. So I've just listed a few people here like Amina Yassin, Jay Pitter, Tamika Butler, and collectives like the Colectio Punt Seis in Barcelona, Black Spaces in the US as just a few examples that even I, someone who's not in the field, did not have much trouble coming across. All right, so what's another way that we can start to envision a feminist city? Another thing that I think is important is paying attention to the stories that places tell and telling a different story. Over the summer of 2020, with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw people all over the world trying to reclaim space by tearing down statues of slave owners, of colonizers, of leaders of genocide, of rapists, of <clears throat> people whose values we don't embody anymore and who we don't want to necessarily uphold and have serve as monuments or whose stories we want to be the dominant ones in urban space. But again, the good news is that these are things that we can change. We can reimagine the stories that our places tell through things that are as simple as naming, as different sorts of statues, as different sorts of 
images in urban public space and with different stories. You know, you go to a little parquet and there's a little brass plaque that tells you about, you know, so-and-so was the quote unquote first homeowner in this area. But often these stories ignore, for example, First Nations history, Indigenous people. They ignore uh, histories of slavery and colonization. They ignore women. They ignore other groups of people like immigrants, for example, who've also contributed to these communities over time. So there's opportunity there to, again, through community consultation, through talking with people who are experts and true stakeholders in these concerns, uh, how do we tell a different story through our space? So this is obviously a symbolic kind of measure. And you might say, well, does it really matter? You know, is symbolism that important in this case? I would argue that it's not everything, but places really do communicate powerful messages to us about who belongs and who doesn't, who we value and who we don't value, and whose histories deserve a prominent place in our city. So I think this is an area that we can't ignore as one for intervention. Another part of envisioning the feminist city is asking how we can design spaces that prioritize care work. By care work, we mean all of the labor, usually unpaid, although a good deal of it does happen in, in paid public spaces as well, but all of the labor that goes into taking care of human beings, keeping us fed and clean and healthy and safe, cared for emotionally, physically, mentally, and so on. So much of this work is invisible. So much of it is still done disproportionately by women. And so much of it is relegated to the private sphere. If we want to change that, I think it's not just a conversation about, hey, men should do more work in the private sphere of the home within the traditional nuclear heterosexual family. That's not that revolutionary an idea, although it seems to be still taking kind of a long time to catch on. So we could do so with some improvement there. But what if we started to reconceptualize <clears throat> where care work happens and the, the space of the home as the site of care work in different ways and started to ask, <clears throat> how can our cities and buildings support care work outside of the home. So one of the images here is of a man changing the diaper of a small child just on a sidewalk, presumably because there's likely, even if there is a public toilet nearby, there might not be a changing table within the bathroom that is designated for men, or there would be a lack of family toilets or accessible toilets that would make this work possible. And this just reinforces the idea that this work should be done by women or that it should be done in the home. During the pandemic, we've also seen that we've needed to reorganize care work as people have been more isolated and particularly vulnerable people like seniors, people living on their own, people with disabilities. So how can we think about making our cities work in ways that bring care to those people instead of relying on care somehow magically invisibly just happening in the home? So one example that we could look to is the uh, neighborhood of Aspern in Vienna. And this is a kind of well-known experiment, if you will, in gender mainstreaming, the process of running planning policy and architecture decisions through a gender equity lens and saying, will this contribute to gender equity or not? So some of the things that they did in this example were to, uh, first of all, ask women <laughs> as well as men, but ask women, what do you need in urban space? What would make your life easier? And they found some of the typical things like women take more pedestrian trips than men. Um, women have a greater need of things to be located close together and so on. And women had concerns about the way in which the homes that were typical of the area were not really supporting their care work needs. So they invited women architects to design housing that um, had certain interventions of it like uh, pram storage on every floor in the building and wide stairwells to encourage neighborly interactions, flexible flat layouts and high quality secondary rooms that could be used for all sorts of different purposes and that the height of the building would be low enough to ensure a kind of eyes on the street community neighborliness. And in the outdoor built environment, they also encourage the planners to include things like uh, kindergarten and play areas directly adjacent to home spaces, thus 
integrating these areas in a more productive way, but also taking some of that care work outside of the private space of the home, but still keeping it accessible and uh, making sure that people are not burdened with long journeys through the city to these different kinds of areas. So my second to last principle here for envisioning a feminist post-COVID city is inviting us to rethink at a real core level the kinds of spaces that we designate as public and private. So the goal of this is to create spaces that will enable all sorts of care work to become more public, more collective, and my hope is more valued, more respected, less stigmatized, and so on. So can we think about these urban public spaces that I said have become so hostile in many ways to actual human use? Could we reimagine them as spaces of community kitchens, of learning environments for children, as places where you don't need to go and buy an expensive meal under a plastic bubble on a sidewalk to be part of the public realm, but where anybody could go and have a meal provided for them at low cost or, or no cost, where the labor of providing those meals was shared collectively and properly um, paid for. I think really it's a failure of the imagination to think that these sorts of things can only happen in private spaces and that public spaces can't allow this, but everything from zoning restrictions and bylaws and so on can make it quite difficult for this to happen even when community will is there. But again, I think the pandemic provides a bit of an opportunity for us to remember, hey, we have a lot of great spaces, but we're using them in really um, often boring and at the far end, even hostile and negative ways. How could we re rethink this? So another example here would be something like co-housing. So part of rethinking public and private also means rethinking the home and being creative about uh, imagining the home as more than just a container for, again, a traditional nuclear family, heteropatriarchal type unit as the building block of society, which I think many people have realized as we've been locked up in these little units, uh, how stressful it is to put all of this pressure onto that unit to sustain us in every possible way. But co-housing, of which there are many examples even here in Canada, can provide alternatives uh, for elderly people, for example, for young families, for those who want to live in more eco-friendly ways and share more collective resources, everything from your laundry and kitchen space to your gardens, to your play space and, and so on. This is another example that I, I came across that during the pandemic where many public libraries aren't able to be as open to the public, but they are essential places where people go to uh, access Wi-Fi, for example, because not everyone has Wi-Fi, again, as so many people have seemingly discovered for the first time. But taking uh, over some outdoor public space and providing little um, free Wi-Fi areas for library patrons to come and, and make use of. Okay, my final feminist principle, just going to state the obvious here that people have bodies, but this often seems to be a fact that either architects and planners forget, like in the Cornell Library example, or maybe just don't want to think about. I guess nobody goes through many years of architecture school to imagine themselves designing a really great public toilet or an amazing wheelchair ramp or a brilliant public bench. And yet these are the kinds of things that make a real day-to-day -day difference in the lives of so many people. So what if we could take a step back and as we're imagining the spaces that we want to design, our brilliant ideas and so on, we really think about the embodied humans and perhaps non-humans who will also be making use of these spaces and recognize that we have needs for things like using the bathroom, rest, water, shade, warmth, shelter, food, and so on. And if these things were more than afterthoughts that we kind of have to jerry-rig into the design at a later point in time or that they're seen as detracting from somehow the beauty, elegance, and ideal function of the space, what if we put them first? What kinds of spaces could we imagine in these experiences? And again, with the pandemic, people have noticed that going out in the city can be quite difficult if there's nowhere for you to use the bathroom, if there's no all gender restrooms or accessible restrooms, if there's nowhere to sit or rest, if the public spaces that we do have don't allow for social 
gatherings, even small social gatherings to take place because there's a bench over here and then 10 meters away, there's another bench, but you can't sit and have a conversation with two groups of people on them. So let's start from the body and see what we would come up with there. And again, I think the example of, of public toilets is really key. And I'm showing a tweet here just from a couple of days ago from Toronto City Councilor Mike Layton, who is responding to a comment from Mayor John Tory. And Tory said that they uh, could not really support winterizing public washrooms in the city of Toronto because this would encourage uh, more permanent homeless encampments. And Mike Layton tweeted a series of things in response to this one of which says, denying access to washrooms denies people of their dignity. If it's your delivery driver, your daughter, I yet acknowledge the gender lens to this debate, or your neighbor, that stranger who is struggling to find a place to sleep. So Leighton is reminding us that this isn't only a homelessness issue, although certainly homeless people have a right and a, a need for these public services, but so does everybody in the city. And to imagine that we would deny basic human rights to everybody out of a misplaced fear of homelessness and homeless people is um, really kind of a, a height of cruelty and goes again to my point that perhaps we've been thinking about our cities as places where we create fear of one another rather than as places that we imagine as gathering spots. So again, public toilets, maybe it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but it can be one of those things that's at the real root and foundation of allowing people to participate in public space. So let me come to my conclusions and try to remind us all like, why does this matter? Why should we care about it? What are the big, big questions that are at stake here? Well, one of them is this thing called the economy that we've been all told that we have to protect and even risk our lives to maintain and sustain in this time, but to too rarely do we ask the question, what is the real foundation of the economy? It's human beings and it's the care work that keeps human beings alive and able to work in this thing called the economy. So we have to start from that place and not, again, imagine it as an afterthought that comes after we imagine what the economy is and how our cities will be set up to support it. Questions of safety. Safety in the workplace, whatever that workplace is. Safety at home, recognizing that the home is not a safe place for everybody and in public spaces. But safety here is not seen as a function of, of policing, for example, but as a function of good uh, communities, of places where people have their basic needs met and so on. Crises, this is not the last crisis and this is not the only crisis that we are even currently in. We are just not talking as much about climate change, for example, at the moment. But this has to remind us how resilient are we really? How prepared are our cities and our care networks and the economy to weather the crises that are coming at us and are indeed already here? And finally, I wanna suggest that we can use some of these feminist principles to think about community in a productive way. How do we cultivate a sense of responsibility to one another through design rather than a sense of hostility and fear of one another? In what ways could our cities and our buildings and our great urban places be made to remind one another that uh, even if we are not exactly all in this together in the same way that we do share obligations to take care of one another. Um, and I believe that our cities could actually make that easier for us to accomplish rather than get in our way. So thank you very much for uh, listening to these remarks tonight. It's our, our pleasure. Leslie, thank you so much. I. Um... <clears throat> I, I, I want to reinforce how helpful and refreshing it is to hear the city described through a very different lens. Um, and uh, thank you again for how much you, or how well you framed the issues. I'm reminded a bit about uh, Jane Jacobs, who uh, again came at the city, not as an architect, in fact, architects who she kind of dismissed as utopians who had kind of conceptual ideas that, that flew in the face of or were done completely independently of the way people actually lived and how, how important a role she's played in us considering city design. So you're, I think you're very much in, in that tradition um, and it's extremely refreshing to hear you. So thank you, great. Um,
I think all of us have lots of questions. I just wanted to remind people, and I, I realize that those of us who spend a lot of time on Zoom love that chat function because uh, anything that pops into our mind or references or things like that, we're able to share with each other. In the webinar format, however, we, we are using the Q&A function, which uh, all of us, I think, are a little less familiar with. Um, so I would encourage people to go ahead and pose questions. And Nicole and I are gonna uh, try to monitor the Q&A box uh, and direct those questions to Leslie. Um, and I apologize for those of you who feel like we're uh, not giving you a chance to express yourself by not having the chat activated. Um, great, so I'm going to actually uh, turn it over to Nicole um, to pose a, uh, the first question and we'll take it from there, uh, Nicole. Thank you, Ben. Um, Leslie, thank you so much for a very important presentation. Um, you've covered so many critical topics, um, thinking about the users, making sure that we're telling the right stories and ensuring that we rethink um, public and private spaces. So my first question for the evening is in the feminist city, you speak a lot about your own experiences. Um, and experiences of women that are sometimes uh, generally unpleasant uh, for women in the city. How do we keep men, and I'm very cautious to use the word men because even men within the city have different experiences uh, depending on their, um, their race, their gender, their, their physical attributes. Um, but how do we keep those who are more privileged, engaged in the process uh, of creating more equitable cities so it doesn't become a situation where women are having to fix problems that they did not create? It's a, it's a great question and it remains a, a difficult one in that often the conversations that have things like gender or feminism in the title um, Men, especially, you know, maybe cisgender men assume, oh, that's not for me. I don't need to go to that uh, webinar. I don't need to go to that conference panel. I'm not going to pick up that book. I'm not going to take that course. And as someone who's a women's and gender studies professor, I can say this is still very much alive and well in terms of the composition who, sh who shows up in the room. So gosh, if I had the answer to this, I think I would bottle it and sell it for a million dollars. But part of the uh, and I think what I'm trying to get at with some of the aspects in my presentation is a reminder that, in fact, many of these changes are about making the city more accessible, more livable, more welcoming, safer, in fact, for everybody. They're not about taking anything away from those who have more privilege, although perhaps for those who even kind of unconsciously rely on the unpaid or underpaid care work of other people in their family or, or in their circles to do some of the labor that they've never had to do or had to think of there, you know, it might shake things up a little bit for them, but I, I don't think those are necessarily bad things that, you know, just destroy lives, for example, to have to change a few extra diapers or to um, pay your, your housekeeper more for the labor that they do. So part of that engagement is recognizing that these are not, again, kind of frills that we add on to the sort of universal standard of design, but that these are things that actually uh, lift up everybody in the city. If you're someone who uh, wants to see less crime, for example, then you need to be invested in uh, questions of affordable housing, right? You need to be invested in questions of good support for um, mental health broader educational opportunities, uh, raising minimum wage, all of these things actually, when we have a more stable foundation in society, it, it creates greater um, safety and comfort even for those who already have more privilege. Right, exactly. Great answer. Thank you, Nicole. Um, maybe we'll jump back and forth between some of our questions and the questions in the chat room. It's really great to see the, uh, a bunch of them there. Uh, the, there are a couple of questions dealing with um, something that occurred to me too, which is that um, the, the, the lecture comes with the title feminist, but the, the way you're talking about things is really in a much broader sense or, or goes beyond things which we, those of us who continue to struggle what, with what feminism actually is and isn't, uh, see as being well beyond the purview of feminism like universal design. Uh, do you want to comment a little bit on why the, the, the feminist perspective is, is 
is paramount in, in what you're saying or to what degree it is? Mm. Well, first of all, I'll just say that I, I don't think that feminism is the only or necessarily has to be the primary lens through which we view some of these questions. It happens to be the one that uh, that I come from based on my own educational background and my own uh, passions and interests and experiences. But I think we'll see that many equity seeking movements, again, whether they are around accessibility and universal design, uh, racial justice, that, well, not everything they say is going to be the same, but there are certain underlying principles that are going to be held in common amongst many of these different views. I think for me, one of the things that feminism does offer here that often gets left out or is maybe somewhat secondary in, in other, I guess, ideas of a just or equitable city is this question about care work, uh, which honestly is not something that was at the top of my mind when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. But since the pandemic and everything that has really uh, been put into such stark relief for so many families around the world, these questions of care work have really bubbled to the surface for me and made me think, well, yeah, in many ways, what I'm suggesting um, as the, the core centerpiece of the feminist city is a careful city, right? A city that places care work, that the human being and the reproduction and care of human beings at the center, not as something that we figure out how to do later or that we relegate to private spaces and under exploitative conditions. So again, it's not that only feminism could think about that, but historically feminists have had a lot to say about care labor and the yeah. exploitative nature of it and its gender division. So for me, that would be the, the piece that I'm trying to really kind of shoehorn in here amongst um, many of these other other questions. I, that's, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, the, the, uh, the focus on care work really came through um, I, just because I'm teaching it now in a course on housing, I, I you think of Hannah Arendt and the distinction between labor work, action, et cetera, et cetera. I'm also thinking about Jane Jacobs inveighing against the modernists and having kind of, well, as we like to say, uh, solve the problem of the unit at the expense of the city and, and really arguing for some of the fundamental principles of the traditional city. And yet a lot of the images that you showed um, as being problematic are, are things that we associate like the brownstone. Uh, and the stairs with the, with the with the traditional city. It struck me as you were speaking that um, what ends up being to some degree gendered, male female, was through much of time also a a, 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 a rich poor owned owner distinction as well. Um, I lived in Paris for a year and marveled at the way the French can actually. Um, raise families in apartment buildings where people have to go up and down tiny little elevators or huge flights of stairs. And it, you have to be reminded that no respectful French family raises children without an au pair or two to do all that labor work for them. So it comes to a question of wealth in some ways and that the city is, a, as we know at the traditional city is really designed around the idea that there are those available to serve and those who pay them or, or own them uh, in order to, uh, to, to serve. Women being of course the best example of that, women were considered to be chattel um, really right up until the franchise was extended at the beginning of the 20th century. So um, anyway, those are, thank you. I, I, I wanted to I mentioned that as well. Um, Nicole, do you want to jump back in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Leslie, in, in your uh, book, and, and um, I don't know how much you really brought that back up today, but it's, it's really great that you wrote a chapter on a city of friends. Um, and I am starting to think about the pandemic and as you described, and we all know it's changed our lives drastically. Um, and through this chapter where you're speaking about city of friends, uh, you speak about community based places and policies that uh, should support friendships, which are just as valuable as families these days. Um, and then I want to talk again uh, about two things through the lens of the pandemic. Uh, that being friends of family. Uh, the work from home culture has allowed many families and individuals, uh, especially women, to enjoy the privilege of being pregnant uh, at home with a lot of privacy, uh, without any disruption in their uh, career momentums, which is really awesome. Uh, 
at the same time, friends and family connections um, and some of the principles that you brought forward have been neglected due to the lockdown. We have to socially distance. We are not even to, able to um, access these public spaces. So in so many ways, we've also lost a great sense of our communities. Uh, what measures uh, would you say should be taken uh, during the pandemic to support the feminist city? Or would you say that the pandemic in itself does support the feminist city by allowing women to, to be in uh, uh, more safe and secure places, which is not being able to freely walk the cities and enjoy cities at the moment? Mm. Well, I think all sort of good feminist answers to that sort of question would first say, well, you know, which women, right? Which women have that privilege to be at home and to have the home be a safe place? We have known that um, domestic violence rates, including fatal violence against women uh, by intimate partners have increased during the pandemic. And this seems to be almost a worldwide phenomenon that, that people have reported. And even right at the beginning of the pandemic, even the federal government knew it would be a problem. And so extra money was allocated to shelters and so on to uh, help deal with some of what was anticipated to be and did turn out to be a real um, uptick in, in violence. So these questions about the home being a safe place, I think are also ones that to me are very connected to the feminist city idea because the, um, our sort of continual reliance on building these very same type single family homes that don't include sort of real shared or collective spaces that aren't flexible in their design for different family types that aren't really open to like different sorts of co-ownership or co-renting options. There's all sorts of barriers, including zoning in some cases that prevent different types of people from living together, which produces this pressure for um, people to stay in family forms that are either not what they want or are actively dangerous and hostile to them. So in thinking about the city of friends, which you started your question with, part of that for me was like, oh yeah, the city was always so important for my sort of development and cultivation of these friendships. But on a deeper, more radical level, if we started to imagine not organizing society around the building block of the traditional nuclear family, but allowed us to organize it in different ways that could include these, you know, non-romantic relationships like friendship or um, other sorts of ways of cohabitating or looking after children or, you know, owning or sharing property or sharing care work, it really shakes up that status quo, it really shakes up this whole system that we have of, you know, relying on hidden exploitative care labor when we would imagine that people would be freely giving that care labor, but not within this sort of, um, you know, this little bubble of the nuclear family unit. So I think there is something that is both like fun and exciting and necessary and social about friendship, but it's also like really destabilizing to the status quo if we kind of take it a, a little bit further and, and think about how we could really uh, reorganize things based around different kinds of relationships. Awesome, thank you. There's a lot of questions coming in, which is great. That's uh, great, and yeah. <clears throat> so I'm pleased to see a question from Christopher Hoyt. Uh, Chris has uh, been teaching with us for a number of years, but hasn't, uh, hasn't been part of our faculty for the last two years or so. Chris is asking a general question about the workplace. Um, we're all starting to see, you know, the the dissolution of the kind of, or the potential dissolution of that that commercial core and the distribution of work and workplace out throughout the city so that this this commute could disappear and people could be more efficient, be closer to their kids, et cetera, et cetera. You, I was just gonna say, you talk about a lot of little things which are fantastic, a lot of little things to fix. Um, do you imagine sort of much larger changes to the way cities are structured? For instance, if if work gets distributed more, um, will neighborhoods become more important? This whole notion of the 15 minute neighborhood, does that become the more co convivial and sort of friend friend oriented vision of urbanity that you're uh, that you're imagining? I think there's definitely potential there. Yeah, cities, 
in many different places are now more actively talking about this 15 minute ideal, which is the notion that our places of, of home, work, school, leisure, social services, shopping, and green space would be more closely interconnected. And this certainly is very similar to what uh, many feminists have called for for a long time. People who have argued that the separation of home and work, uh, the physical separation over great distances has maintained women's secondary status in the workplace and exploitative conditions mm -hmm. in the home. So yes, I think there's uh, potential for embracing that. However, at the same time, we know that trends like gentrification um, are also part of the mix here. So questions about who gets access to the 15 minute city, who mm -hmm. uh, can afford to live in what would probably, and what are already are more desirable urban conditions mm -hmm. versus those who are pushed out to the more affordable places where those interconnections are much weaker and more precarious. So we have to really, um, think about, you know, does this system, does it really work under a kind of, you know, capitalist uh, land market sort of <laughs> arrangement in the city? Is the 15 minute city really going to be like democratic and inclusive and spread to all sorts of different neighborhoods? Questions about work to me though are also so interesting. You know, how do we reimagine something like a central business district if some large number of those office workers don't go back to skyscrapers in our downtown core. What are these spaces for? I like to think, oh, what if we could reimagine them as spaces where there are homes, where there are daycare centers and uh, schools, as well as workplaces, places to eat, collective kitchens, um, green spaces, like who knows? You know, again, these are privately owned spaces. So it's, it's not like, you know, uh, this this utopian vision is that easy to realize, but it does make me wonder um, what could we do differently with all of that space. Excellent, excellent question. Um, I, you know, from an architectural point of view, uh, building typology is extremely important, and, and the typology of the office tower is very, very difficult to adapt because the floor plates are so deep. Um, so there's, you know, in Europe, for instance, it's, uh, it's uh, in many countries, it's, you're not allowed to build buildings with the floor plates so deep that people don't have immediate and direct access to daylight. But in North America, we, we are building these things. You're, you're right uh, to evoke Jane Jacobs again to talk about, uh, you know, the seeds of demise <clears throat> um, being part of uh, the popularity of a particular area. And she uses Lower Manhattan as an example of of something which became a single use district and died in the process. It became so popular as an office district that everything else was pushed out and it died in the process. But we've also seen how lower Manhattan, for instance, because of the floor plates of the towers are so small, those towers are very easily adapted into, um, into uh, other uses like uh, apartments and things like that too. So well, that's a great point. I was thinking you know, all throughout your, your talk though about the law of unintended consequences. I, Thinking about my my mother's generation, she's one of the first to, uh, you know, to leave the home and go back to the workplace. And this was in the 1970s. And of course, if you look at figures for housing prices in the 1970s, they basically doubled as soon as women could go to work. Women had to go to work, in as much as the system readjusted itself and made work a, a, a mandatory part of home ownership rather than a new option for women. And it seems like in a lot of these cases, like you're describing with a 15 minute neighborhood, that they're really great ideas, but they, they, uh, they're also subject to the laws of unintended consequences. Um, yeah, anyway, that's not a question as much as an observation. Um, Nicole, I'll throw it back to you. Awesome. Um, Leslie, I think, uh, and, and everybody here tonight came to learn something. Um, and speaking about learning, I think the education system is something that we all want to start to try and interrogate. And so I want to go off um, one of Carrie's questions, which was about uh, architectural education, but I think we can think about it as education in general and how we can start to integrate more women and gender studies into a variety of um, professions, not just architecture, thinking about planning, thinking about engineering, et cetera. Um, how do you see um, these very, in top, in, very important topics infiltrating more into our education system so we have better professionals? Mm. Well, I really waver between 
optimism and a bit of despair here. <laughs> optimism because people have seemed uh, interested in, you know, hearing me talk about these things, but the despair is that I am far from the first person or the only person to be saying these things. I put them together in a kind of a fun, cute book that's accessible to, to a wide range of people, but women feminists have been talking about these things for decades, if not well over a century. And so when students come and say, oh, I really wish I had heard about something like this during architecture school or when I was in geography or in planning, and I'm like, oh, but <laughs> it's been out there for so long. So why isn't it coming into the curriculum? And those are questions that uh, probably many of you folks are better positioned to answer than, than I am. But I think we also have to <clears throat> perhaps interrogate, you know, some of these professions like architecture and engineering have such traditions of requiring a kind of demands of, of time and energy that, especially in the schooling process, that make them quite inhospitable for many people who are not already, for example, really financially secure, who don't have a lot of caregiving responsibilities. Um, so anyone who doesn't kind of fit that mold or isn't able to put in 22 hour days or um, you know, work to deadline all hours of the day without ever going home. You know, when I was an undergrad at U University of Toronto, the architecture students had you know, cubicles in Robart's library and they would just bring sleeping bags in there and stay there 24 hours a day, right? So this is not a, a way of life that is really accessible to many people. And so uh, we have to wonder, you know, who is interested in these professions, but is getting pushed out at the undergraduate level, at the master's level, and then within these professions themselves, when there might be a culture of overwork, when there is um, perhaps uh, not as much um, care or thought given to things like work-life balance and so on. Again, I don't want to, I'm not within the profession. I don't know for sure what the conditions are like, but, um, I suspect that some of those norms, because they have been male dominated for so long, are still lingering and making it quite difficult for these different viewpoints to infiltrate both at the level of education and then early on into the profession itself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been really amazing to see at um, some firms like uh, the firm that I work at, Dialogue, um, outside of just the working hours, we're starting to interrogate our projects using metrics like the community wellbeing framework or the gender based analysis plus um, framework that has been created, um, I think, by the Canadian government for us to start asking the right questions about um, inclusion or, or in the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to see more of those tools uh, being used, not just in the education system, but in the profession as well. It's, as you said, this is, it's not a new topic. Okay, there's tons of questions. I'm gonna hand it over back to you, Ben. Me who's on mute. Um, yes, <clears throat> when I'm looking, I'm scrolling uh, frantically up through the Q&A uh, and what I'm seeing is a lot of, uh, I guess, support for the perspectives that you're bringing and a lot of frustration with the status quo um, I also very much agree with you, uh, Leslie, that these issues have been around forever and, uh, and we've been talking about them for a long time. And I think that's part of the, the basis of the frustration here is how difficult it is uh, for them to change. Um, there's, there's a certain bit of, of concern in here about the way our, you know, who controls the way our, our built environments or our environments are built, whether it's developers, uh, city planners, or it's architects, and who, who do we blame, essentially. Um, and so uh, I'm not entirely sure that's the most helpful way to think about it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when, you, uh, when you want to see things change, you really need to think about uh, who the best agents of those changes are. So um, let me think here. Nicole, are there, are there questions that have popped out to you? Uh, you've asked a question about how this perspective might be integrated into education, which is one of the questions here. Um, yes. there, there's a question about whether or not you feel uh, there are other there are examples of other countries or other cities doing it better than we do in North America. That's probably a bit, a bit easy. Um, in particular, in Sweden, uh, it, it, does Europe do it better than North America in your perspective? And is it, uh, is it because of the, uh, the evil S word, the socialist word? Um, and how do we get the question of good design to stop being politicized um, 
so that we can kind of get on with it. So mm -hmm. maybe you can address that. Well, first of all, I would say, I don't know if good design could ever be depoliticized or whether that is even <laughs> something that we would want to do because to me, something being politicized isn't a bad thing. It just means we're paying attention to power. So if we want to ignore power relations, then I don't think we're uh, necessarily going to get to good design. So that, that would be my little comment there. Certainly, I think many European cities do have a better reputation around some of this stuff. And of course, it is a combination of both the kind of social, political, economic conditions, as well as interventions that are being made in the built environment or the use of practices like gender mainstreaming, which for the record, I don't think are the be all and end all of feminist planning and often are not even couched in specifically feminist terms but they do show a willingness to at least raise questions about gender equity in areas that I think in many North American cities were quite resistant to. So one of the examples that I give in my book from Stockholm in Sweden, where they use um, you know, a gender lens to figure out where they're going to plow snow first, right? And in North America, we say, oh my God, why would you think about gender and feminism and snow plowing? But it is a feminist issue. Again, if we think about what I raised earlier that, that women in many places around the world take more pedestrian trips than men do, then whether you clear sidewalks and residential areas has a huge gendered impact. If we prioritize car traffic over public transit systems, bike lanes and pedestrian routes, then we are reproducing what is a, um, a, a more likely to be a man's mode of transportation and of course a less sustainable, less environmentally friendly and less efficient mode of transportation. Uh, so when we plow highways first, we're prioritizing that over other sorts of things. So in places like Stockholm, they're trying to consider these questions and think how could we arrange our snow plowing priorities such that they encourage more people to take transit, to walk if they can, they allow children to get to school and daycare, and they allow uh, the, you know, as many people as possible to not be trapped in their homes during a snow event. Um, I, I'd like to speak on a lot of the questions and there's a couple of themes that are coming up and Leslie, we know you're not an architect, but uh, you did come to an architecture forum. So there, there are um, a lot of people wanting to get some questions uh, or answers to what you imagine as the post-COVID city, um, whether it be um, sidewalks and how those are changed or how the downtown core is changed. I think you did speak a little bit about that, but if you could go into a little bit more detail about any specifics that you think um, are crucial for the post-COVID city? Hmm. Well, some of the things that we have to keep front in mind if we're going to put care work kind of at the center, which to me is, again, the, the kind of core of, a, of any feminist city, but especially I think a post-COVID one where many people have been confronted with the reality that so much of what sustains us we've taken for granted in many ways and our built environments have not been well set up to support or to share this labor. So what are some concrete things we could do? Well, we could think about transportation systems, for example. So we know that in many cities, the way that transportation systems are designed, if you want to go from a neighborhood on, um, you know, kind of in the, the northeast corner to one that's in the northwest corner, you can't just go straight across from east to west. You have to go into the central city first, for example, on public transit, and then out again to that other neighborhood. But if your elderly parent lives in that neighborhood or your, um, you know, children's doctor is in that neighborhood, it's a much less, you know, efficient, um, time efficient mode of transportation. You might have to get on and off multiple stops, you might be charged more for using, you know, different municipal transit systems. Uh, so care work is not really, the way that it actually happens is not really well imagined in our transportation system. So I don't have that exact blueprint in my mind. I'm not a transportation engineer either, but it's something that I think about when, again, those very material realities of how people 
move through the city to do all the different kinds of things they need to do and how we haven't really designed our mobility networks to uh, make care work efficient and easy. Um, I, I do think, you know, in my talk, I did point to, as you say, some concrete things that we could imagine for our urban public spaces, everything from toilets to places with shade and shelter to uh, locations where collective cooking and food provision can happen. And as I say, I think over time we've, we've, we've like peeled these things out of cities in part out of fear, whether it's fear of homeless people, fear of crime, fear of terrorism, um, to the extent that now we're like left with these like very empty spaces in some ways, or we've just left it to private businesses to kind of fill that void. But of course, that's not really accessible to everybody. So what are some of the ways that we could bring back like human scale um, uses to urban environments and make them actually pleasant places to, to be in? Um, and by encouraging this wide range of use, I think we also encourage greater levels of safety. People report a lot of feelings of unsafety when they're alone in abandoned single use kind of urban environments, but people tend to feel more safe when there are um, greater numbers of people on the street and people using the public space for lots of different reasons. It, it reminds me of some comments <clears throat> by the fellow who wrote Happy City, I guess Charles Montgomery talks about the fact that, that what we want and what we need are actually quite different. And another comment that, uh, you know, in North America, well, there are a couple of, there are really only three super land rich, we discount Russia, uh, super land rich countries in the world is Canada, the US and Australia, all of whom build their cities quite differently than they were built uh, in Europe or might be built in China or other places in Asia where there is not nearly as much land to go around. Someone observed that in North America, we pride ourselves um, on being extremely multicultural, it has a lot to do with a lot of things, including the, the percentage of immigrants that make up our society. But they said that in fact, it doesn't mean we get along. It just means we have more room than most to segregate ourselves. And indeed our, our um, our approach to city building in North America tends to be to segregate everything, to segregate uses, to segregate demographic groups, to segregate rich from poor. Um, and this is a problem. Our natural tendency is to do that, even though we know that's probably not the best thing for us to do. We have the opportunity to do it and it, and it just seems to be where we, we tend to go. Uh, or as you say, when left alone, that's the way things go. They self-segregate over time. Uh, what you're describing is, is a much more integrated society where you know, those who are being cared for and those who are giving the care can afford to live um, in closer proximity to each other where people can afford to walk to places um, where people can work closer to home and therefore be closer to family. And I've heard, certainly heard from a number of my colleagues how, how positive COVID has been. Uh, I understand it's just for a, a small percentage, but those who can work at home have really felt that it's, it's strengthened family bonds um, and, and allowed families to spend a lot more time together than they would normally have to do. Anyway, again, that's more of an observation, but I, I wonder, um, you know, to what degree uh, it's our natural tendency to resist um, the, the, the very kinds of things that you're, um, that you're suggesting that we, <laughs> we pursue. Well, I, I, I always resist any kind of, you know, naturalistic explanations for things. That's, again, my, my training and background, but I guess we... Uh, we might substitute that with a, well, let's, uh, for example, let's follow the money, right? Like, let's see who really benefits from things being organized in this way, right? Uh, somebody benefits from it, even if it's not immediately obvious. So let's follow the train of power, let's follow the money, let's follow the spheres of influence and so on and see how the, the way that things just seem to shake out um, actually is the very kind of foundation of the power relations and the, the so-called status quo that we that we have. But I do agree with the general point that we seem to have a tendency to want to come up with what seem like quick sort of spatial solutions to what are actually much more deep-rooted social and economic problems. So we'll just move things around in different areas, we'll move different groups of people around, we'll <clears throat> create different sorts of housing and projects over here, and we'll uh, have a red light district over here and we'll just separate all of these things and then everybody will just get along because they won't have to deal with the reality of something like poverty, for example, or industrial noise or, or whatnot in their own backyard. Um, and, but again, you know, questions of power show us who really is able to um, insulate themselves from the, 
more sort of challenging aspects of living in a dense urban environment and who really doesn't have that choice at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's a, a very important point and, and leads to uh, a question that I have on equity and, in, and inequality um, because they are very different um, and they play a huge role in, in the cities that we're imagining um, that are better. And uh, I really admire, um, even in your writing, that you constantly ask the question, you know, who does this benefit? And by asking who, you know, these social changes or design changes or infrastructure changes benefit, we're also able to analyze or assess who it doesn't benefit. And so I, I'd like to speak a little bit more, and I think it ties to a lot of the questions as well. Um, how do you imagine um, equity and equality in these human-made environments um, playing a better role moving forward? Mm. Uh, because, you know, as you're speaking about the feminist city, it's not just about the feminist um, it, or the woman, uh, the feminist city benefits everybody, um, but it would need, again, we need to look at the, the lens of equity and, equ and equality and who it's for. Absolutely, that's so critical to point out because the feminist city project as I see it is not just about taking that uh, typical white able-bodied cisgendered man and saying, well, here's just a female version of him and let's design everything around her needs that is is not equity that's a certain kind of equality that imagines that that feminism is about raising um, some women up to the sort of height of of power and social influence of some men but of course leaves out really huge swaths of society and we might call that white feminism or liberal feminism or second wave feminisms goes by goes by different names but I'm more interested in, yeah, this equity vision that for me is informed by a feminist intersectional lens where we understand that different systems of power, racism, heteronormativity, um, class, gender, ableism intersect with one another. They're not just running parallel or we, we add them together in some kind of like layers of, of oppression or privilege, but that they Right. shape the life chances and the life experiences of people um, based on the way that those systems interact with one another. So for me in writing the book, as you point out, I, I try the best I can, given the fact that I, I definitely have my own sort of spots of ignorance as well to question just because something might uh, feel good for me with the kind of privileges that I embody as an able-bodied middle-class cisgender white woman, is not necessarily going to be beneficial to others and might in fact actively harm other people. So if mm -hmm. uh, more police going through my neighborhood makes me feel safe, which it doesn't, but if it did, someone like me, um, it's probably actually going to create more harm and violence in the lives of other people, whether they are homeless people, sex workers, people of color, poor people right. in that same environment. So it's really important when we think about this equity lens to recognize that, um, yeah, we're not all starting on a level playing field. There are very long histories of oppression and power that come behind us and that are really, you know, literally the soil and the, the cement under which our cities are, or over which our cities are constructed. And uh, a feminist vision has to, to the best that it can, try to take into account those differences. One way that I try to think about it's not a perfect solution, but when we think, okay, well, we're not just going to replace the man with a woman who looks and acts the same, but what if we imagined mm -hmm. our city spaces as being designed around the needs of those who are the most vulnerable or who've been made the most vulnerable in our society? So if we asked people like homeless people or asked sex workers or single mothers or recent immigrants or elderly people or people with a disability, what would truly make the city better for you? Um, that kind of, I think, gives us the best chance at moving towards real equity. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and that brings you back to one of your key points, which is that uh, design can't be done in isolation. It has to be done with a huge amount of consultation. And there is so much to learn from the people that actually use and comprise the city. So. Um, 
I think um, on that note, we should wrap up the discussion. Uh, we've left all the questions basically unanswered. In other words, we <laughs> it didn't indicate that any of them had been answered so that everybody has a chance to sort of look at the discussion that's going on in the chat room. And, and I thank everybody who's participated that way. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of contributions and a lot of interesting ideas being explored there. Thank you so much, Leslie, um, again, for coming from a, a different uh, background and a different lens and helping us to see what we do a little bit better. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure having you here tonight. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to thank you and to thank um, Ellen and uh, Gabrielle who produced tonight. I'd like to thank our sponsors again uh, and thank Architecture Week for, uh, for picking up some of these issues and allowing us to continue to, uh, to engage them uh, in a public forum uh, over the next little while in Ottawa. And uh, finally, thank you, Nicole, uh, Nicole for, uh, for joining us. I don't know what time it is in South Africa now, but uh, I think I'd still rather be there with you, than, <laughs> and even if it's late. So, Leslie, um, we hope to uh, see more from you in the future. And with that, I'm going to call an end to tonight's um, uh, session and uh, wish everyone a, a great week. Thank you, everyone. Good, Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.